to introduce who we have on the call. We've got our operations manager, Sonia Sinanan. Sonia, if you want to say a quick low so people can see you. Hi, I'm Sonia from the ELC. <laughs> and we have Ollie Rodka, who is our site development manager and also sits on the board, um, having been one of the founders of the ELC. So, hi, hi Ollie. Nice to see you all. And we have Oliver Bettany, who is our membership engagement and what's your role again? Just, uh, just membership. membership and engagement manager. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Oliver. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> that's Oliver. And Ruth um, is unfortunately having issues with her video, so we can't see her lovely face. But Ruth is our planning manager who um, submits our planning applications. Um, so hi, Ruth. Hi. <laughs> Um, so firstly, I just want to start with some polls to kind of understand, um, you know, where people are coming at really, in terms of your understanding of the ELC, which will help us kind of pitch the session in the most useful way and whereabouts you're based. So I'm just launching the poll now. You should see two questions come up. So if you can all take a moment to do that, that would be great. It's definitely a range across the UK. And lots of people interested in applying for a farm with us in the future, which is great to know. Some people here have interest. Okay, this is really useful. Thank you, everybody. Gonna keep it open for a few more seconds and then I will share the results. Okay, so I'm just sharing the results. Hopefully you can all see that. Okay, stopping that share. Um, so yeah, I'm going to launch straight into the presentation then firstly, we have Oliver, uh, Ollie, sorry, talking about the kind of context and the history of the ELC and our overall vision. And then yeah, we'll proceed to talk about our model and how we work, the processes of app applying and the planning process, and then what's going on on our current sites and our search for future sites. So over to you, Ollie, once Oliver is, um, starts the presentation. Yeah, hi everybody. I hope you're all having a good uh, a good remote Oxford. Um, yeah, we're just going to have one person doing the presentation and uh, sharing their screen, so we'll just be giving Oliver prompts. Hopefully, so. Um, so the the first slide is really just a bit of context, uh, and I'm sure most people here would uh, know and understand um, the the next few comments. Um, the, the wider context that we're working in and, and the reasons that um, a group of us set up uh, ELC uh, well over 10 years ago now. Um, and all of these things, unfortunately, were the, were the case then and are even more clearly the case now. Um, the, the, we're in a climate emergency. I'm sure that is uh, known and obvious to everyone. So we need a radically different food system from the one that we've got now. Um, Unfortunately, and despite all the amazing things that we're hearing about at ORFC this year, um, I think it is important to remember that, you know, most of the land in this country is still, um, most of the farmland is still managed under a very productivist industrial system. And it's going to take a huge amount of effort from, from all of us working in different ways to change that. Um, there's no overall coherent land use strategy that is going to align the different things that, that need to be addressed. Um, our dependence on fossil fuels, the, the, the crisis with nature, wildlife loss, the social and economic damage that's being done, the lack of equality between uh, people and, and between communities, and the need and the important role that food production has uh, and land use has in uh, solving some of those problems. Next, please. Um, our, our work is about uh, proving that there are some um, better land use models out there and obviously we've heard a lot about them in the last week or so. Um, we're showing that there are multiple benefits that we can address all these different things. Um, we can regenerate rural communities whilst providing sustainable livelihoods that people can live in a low impact way and still have decent quality of life that we can benefit nature and provide um, good healthy produce from farms. Um, in particular, we champion a small scale um, farming model, I guess in, in conventional farming terms it's, it's micro farms really, all of our existing farms are 
uh, between the sort of three and 10 acre size. It's obviously absolutely tiny compared to the direction of travel in the last uh, 50, 80 years in terms of farming. But we think that is uh, enough and plenty for people to, to undertake a big farming operation. Although that doesn't mean that there's not a role for larger scale land use and farming models. Um, and yeah, I think although the urgency of the problems that we're facing is now very widely accepted, much more widely accepted than it was sort of 10 or 15 years ago, uh, the need to bring all of these different elements together in a, in a holistic approach is still definitely there. And uh, we hope that you can find a way to, to join us in uh, making that transition. Uh, so so the, the summary of our vision is that we want to see a living, working countryside. Um, and in a way, that is a response to, to um, sort of cultural and social economic changes over the last 20, 30, 40 years, where rural areas have become very much a, a home for people um, fleeing the city, but not producing from the land, um, speculating on land use value, not using the land and, and farms growing in size. We want to see people in the countryside, in rural areas, working the land and producing all the benefits that we know are possible. And, and working on healthy farm businesses that our model has shown and plenty of other models show as well are, are good for people and good for the planet. And I suppose in, in summary, I think is a, you know, it is possible to have a win-win-win situation, a climate, nature, people solution um, if we all work together to, to make it happen. That's great. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. It's great to see so many people here and from so many different places and uh, and also to know that lots of you are interested in um, the work of the ELC, but also potentially becoming um, small uh, holders with the ELC. Um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about um, our mission and how we actually operationalize that. Um, we uh, we create clusters of um, small farms um, that are residential and hopefully are affordable, uh, operate on low impact principles and cooperatively. Um, we also want to demonstrate that, um, that marginal lower grade agricultural, agricultural land can be improved using um, organic principles that our farmers use in their farm businesses. Um, we protect the land that we buy in perpetuity for agroecological use. And we do that um, by maintaining the freehold of the land and using a management plan um, that we work with our, uh, we work with our tenants um, with. And, we, and we're currently growing the ELC so that we can become self-sustainable for future generations. So our farms are available for um, many years to come. Um, we undertake research as part of our work to provide evidence of the benefits of low impact ecological agriculture, um, both for local communities and for the natural environment. And we campaign for policy change that encourages low impact development, um, hopefully um, in educating planners about the need for these types of um, projects. Uh, and we'll talk about, uh, my colleague Ruth will talk a bit more about that later on. Um, Oliver, could we have the next slide, please? In order to, to do what we do, we have we raise uh, money through um, a variety from a variety of sources. We have our own um, investor members and um, and they hold community shares in, in the organization and we raise funds that way um, once every other year, approximately. Um, and we get funding we get funding from a variety of um, uh, charitable funders and we also raise loan finance to purchase land. Um, once we have purchased land we design a cluster of residential farms and we take, um, we create um, a very comprehensive planning application which we um, take to the local authority and hopefully obtain planning permission for, um, re for, for farmers to live on the um, small holdings. Um, we sell leases on the land and we pass on um, hopefully only the costs of uh, what it's cost us to create the small holdings and sometimes that's subsidized um, by uh, funding from other organizations um, and we don't pass on any uplift that would be gained from having planning um, permission on, a, on an agricultural on a piece of agricultural land. Um, then um, we recruit the farmers 
uh, and we have a, an extensive recruitment process, which um, again, we're going to talk about a bit later on. Um, we create ecological management plans for each site that are site specific, and then we monitor those, um, the progress against those plans on an annual basis with our smallholders. Um, this is a picture of our barn at Arlington and there's an illustration of what we offer on our site. So we create an infrastructure on site, including a barn um, and a solar array for um, electricity. Um, we can move on, thank you. Um, so what, uh, in a nutshell, what we offer um, uh, is hopefully enough to provide a supportive framework for new entrant farmers to establish their farm businesses. Um, and um, that includes planning permission to build a low impact dwelling on the land, a shared timber frame barn, a highway authority compliant access track, um, renewable energy generation and rainwater harvesting, um, one year of business mentoring from a sector expert for the farm businesses. And we do that, um, you know, tailored to each individual farm. Um, we organize volunteer um, days to for tree planting and um, other support for the farmers as they get started. Um, and then there's ongoing support and advice and the opportunity for mutual support and collaboration through the cluster model, which is where there are three farmers um, starting on site at the same time. Um, that is it in a nutshell. Obviously, we'd be very happy to answer your questions at the in the question and answer session um, of the um, uh, question and answer part of this session. Uh, and I'm handing over to. Yeah, it's me. Um, <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> hi, everyone. So um, one of my jobs at the ELC is to maintain the steward application process. Um, which is um, a fairly thorough process, as you can imagine. Um, I'm going to take you through the steps in that process um, in, over the next couple of slides. I think um, a couple of important things to say about that initially is that it is what we call an open process. So we're kind of really aiming to um, support people and pretty much you know, any stage that they might be at in their journey of becoming agroecological farmers. So whether people are at a kind of a, an early stage of just really beginning to kind of explore what that might mean for them, or whether they have had loads and loads of experience over the years and are really ready in some ways to sort of take on a plot. And we're really welcoming people to make inquiries um, and kind of create a really create a bit of a pipeline in the coming years of people that we're kind of almost nurturing um, uh, and having a bit of backwards and forwards about in terms of like what ex what kind of experience and work experience might be useful um, in order to get to that stage where they're kind of ready to, to make an application and to, and to take on a plot. Um, it's a model that isn't um, uh, for everyone um, because um, we're a cooperative and our steward members are members of that cooperative and it does require you know a significant amount of engagement really um, on, on top of all of the all of the kind of additional sort of farm work you can imagine of setting up a farm you know there's, there's a great deal of work that we do with our um, our stewards um, a great deal of support that we provide but it's a it's a reciprocal process and, so, and it simply isn't for everyone um, so our application process is kind of designed to uh, for people to kind of figure out for themselves that um, if it's right for them or not. Um, it's a pretty lengthy process. Uh, um, it can take um, up to a year or longer from making an initial application to, to signing a lease. Um, and the length of the process is broadly determined by a couple of factors. Um, and that is um, the experience of the applicants and the availability of, of our sites. We currently have five sites um, which um, three of which are in development and we're in the process of um, seeking um, uh, applicants for one of those. We've kind of earmarked for two of the existing sites um, uh, already kind of looked, talking to potential steward farmers for those plots, but we are, um, as we'll talk about later, um, do we do have um, plots available um, at our site in, Orchard, in, in Cornwall. Um, 
so suitability broadly determined by your agricultural experience, um, your business experience, you know, your capacity to put together a sort of a solid business plan, which has, um, you know, a degree of sort of rigor in terms of um, it being, uh, you know, a, a, a realistic and viable plan. Um, low impact living experience, because these are off grid sites, we do provide um, uh, infrastructure like a solar system and rainwater catch, catchment and, um, and, and increasingly um, either mains water or some or a borehole um, to provide water for the site. Um, but they, they are um, sort of 20 acre sites where typically we'll have sort of three um, uh, plots. Um, and so there's a great deal of sort of, 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 of cooperation and kind of uh, I just, I guess, just being alongside other farmers, you know, rubbing shoulders, supporting one another, but also, you know, needing to to have those the, that that cooperative outlook in order to kind of make those um, relationships thrive. Um, the final um, factor is availability of finance, because it, even though what we offer is significantly more affordable than um, might be possible if you were to buy um, a small holding with um, a, a pre-existing home, um, there is a, um, a significant, I guess, cost in terms of um, infrastructure that you would be setting up to set up your farm business and um, a deposit on the 150 year lease, which is a, around the region of around 20,000 pounds for a 20% a 20 deposit on, a, on, a, on one of our leases. So there's some, um, some savings required um, for, um, for, for people who are interested in making an application. Um, our process broadly, broadly um, is in two stages. The first stage um, is to read as much as you can about what we offer on our website and then contact us um, to share a little bit of information about yourself. Um, we, there might be a little bit of toing and throwing via email um, to kind of, to kind of get, get a better sense of of background and experience and then uh, a telephone call where we can um, get to know one another a little bit. Um, you can ask the questions that you, that you have about whether or not it's going to be the right opportunity and that we can kind of get a better sense of um, experience and background and all those kinds of things to determine whether or not you know now is the time to make an application or whether or not there's a little bit more work needed in order to get to that stage. Um, if um, you know, we agree that you're kind of ready to, uh, to make an application and we'll send you an application pack which contains an application form and um, some other resources to support the um, creation of your business plan. Um, and if there is a specific site that you want to make an application for which is kind of ready to go, then yeah, we'll ask you to, um, to put together a business plan um, and that is, you know, would be a kind of a first draft business plan. Um, so it certainly wouldn't need to be completely, completely sort of polished and finished because we would be working on that with you to an extent, take it if, uh, and supporting you to kind of to develop it. But certainly it needs to have a, a degree of sort of a professional rigor to it, um, even for a first draft. Um, we'll look at that and we'll look at your application form, um, maybe have a little bit of backwards and forwards around um, a couple of questions for we'll need clarification on and then we'll invite you in for an initial interview um, and that is typically a well at the moment a zoom interview um, might last for sort of an, between an hour and a half to two hours where we would sort of get to get a better sense of your background and experience and, um, and may not necessarily really drill really deeply into the kind of the, the nuts and bolts and the and the and the financial details of your business plan it's more of a sort of a uh, a, a sort of an introduction to that but if we do feel that you know there's a, um, a possibility of a, a really solid synergy between the co-op and, and your plans then um, we would invite you to, into the this, this second stage of the interview process um, which is uniquely tailored for, for individual applicants based on the experience that um, they already have and the experience that we think that you um, would be need to, to take on a plot um, and that would be things like certainly producing a, a second draft of the business plan based on feedback. Uh, it's likely that we might 
ask you to seek additional farm scale uh, of, of experience of some kind, maybe in areas where you want to, de to develop your business, but may not have quite the, the level of experience that we would, we would like to see um, before you take on a plot. Um, you'd attend a second interview where we um, uh, go into much more detail into your business plan and your for financial forecasts and things like that. Um, we might um, uh, invite you to spend a week or so volunteering at one of our existing sites so that you can really get a sense of, of what life on an ELC holding is all about and ask the um, existing stewards, you know, the thousand questions that you want to ask because they're the ones that really have the experience um, li living in, on these off-grid sites. Um, and once, you know, those steps have been completed, uh, potentially we'll be in a position to to ring fence a plot, which means that we wouldn't be, you know, actively seeking um, uh, applications for that plot, and we would make you a sort of a provisional offer of a lease, dependent on a few factors, including um, us su successfully achieving planning permission, because quite often we will be working to identify stewards for our sites at the same time as we are going through the planning process. The idea being that once we have achieved um, planning permission, that's when the five year time frame for the temporary, temporary planning begins. And we uh, then in a position to, to, to create the site infrastructure like the barn and stewards can potentially move on very quickly. Um, uh, sometimes the relevant planning authority requires approval on the business plan. Um, and there is the um, uh, management plan which is something that we would again write in conjunction with your business plan in order to kind of support the agroecological aims of the of the co-op and to ensure that those details of your business plan that we would need to kind of keep an eye on in terms of agroecological aims are, are kind of in there. Um, and once we've done all that, um, we'll sign the lease um, and take a 20% deposit and then you'd be in a position to, to move on site as and when you um, are ready to. And some uh, stewards might move on immediately, some might wait for a while and start just for setting up the infrastructure on site before they actually make the move into a, a static caravan or a similar structure um, for that initial five year period. Okay, pause for breath. Um, I think I'm handing over to, um, to Ruth now, is that right? Yep, that's right. Okay, um, so while we aim to secure planning permission on our sites without identifying um, our tenants or specific business plans, um, this is obviously on the basis that the subsequent small holdings will meet policy requirements. So it's gonna be a little bit useful to have an overview of what these requirements are when you're putting together your business plans. So I'm just gonna give a quick rundown of what these are. Um, so the national planning policy framework, which applies in England states that planning policies and decisions should avoid the development of isolated homes in the countryside unless one or more of the following circumstances apply. And the relevant one to us is that there is an essential need for a rural worker to live permanently at or near their place of work in the countryside. Um, so uh, while the specific criteria which, you'll, which we need to meet in order to demonstrate a need to live on site will vary between the different areas and our different sites, the general requirements are fairly uniform across the country and will involve demonstrating a functional or essential need and financial viability. So functional need is the first one of those. Uh, Ollie, can I have, I mean, Oliver, sorry, next one. Thank you. Um, functional need is demonstrating why it is essential for the proper running of your business for somebody to reside on site. And obviously that will be different for the different businesses, but the key factors will usually include um, the long working, long and anti-social working hours often, and quick response times, which are required uh, for natural growing techniques. And this will be due to various things such as the multifaceted nature of your business, um, manual pest control systems, frost protection, uh, manual polytunnel management, low impact watering methods and other requirements relating to animal husbandry. Um, related to this is also the importance of maximizing efficiency due to the labor intensive nat nature of ecological farming techniques. And finally, um, the financial vi viability of um, agroecological projects often necessitates low cost living or subsistence lifestyles, which in turn will of course require residents on site. Um, 
financial viability is a bit more self-explanatory um, and this just will involve providing robust financial projections uh, which will demonstrate that your business should be profitable within three to five years um, but this will also include demonstrating your firm intention and ability to make your business succeed so it will include a rundown of the uh, relevant skills experience and qualifications that you have as well as any financial investments that you have or will need to make in order to make your business succeed and that's it from the planning point of view and i'm going to hand over to ollie i think yes hello again it's back to me i'm afraid there's only a few of us so you get some of us more than once um i'm just going to give a very quick run through of our existing sites uh, just to give a picture of um or literally a picture of uh, what's happening there um our first uh, site was in mid devon um it's called green and reach it was bought in 2009 uh, we were a really tiny organization then and it took us a few years to get the finances and the, the people and the planning permission. Uh, we finally got the temporary planning permission in 2013 and uh, that was turned into a permanent uh, permission in 2019 after the five year temporary period had ended. And uh, there are three farms there doing a combination of a veg box CSA, a fruit tree business, uh, some local meat sales, salad, veg, herbal medicine and herbs and cut flowers. Uh, the second site was in uh, is at Arlington in East Sussex um, and we got the temporary permission there in 2018 um, and two people, uh, two, two holdings, two businesses, uh, two couples in effect moved on uh, last year or about a year ago. Um, and uh, veg box CSA, flowers, again, salad and veg. And we um, hopefully this very week have the third um, couple getting started there. They've just moved to the area um, and they're sort of getting, getting things established and they'll be doing eggs and fruit. Next, please. Um, third was a place called Furs Hill on the Gower in South Wales and um, that is still going through a planning application process so in Wales um, there is the one planet development planning policy uh, which are sort of con after considerable uh, discussion and, and um, uh, deliberation we decided to use that policy in Wales for, for various reasons um, and we immediately started renting out one part of that site to a local pre-existing CSA called Kai Tan which some of you may have come across uh, they're one of the most well-known CSAs in Wales and I think Tom actually Tom O'Kane has been speaking on one of the ORFC panels elsewhere um, they had an existing looking for additional land because there's so much demand um, and they were very, we were very pleased to help them and they were very pleased to have us help them. So it was a really good case of synergy, helping something pre-existing to grow. Um, they, they are a CSA and uh, we're waiting for the permission, the OPD permission for two other holdings there. Um, Kai Tan don't need a, a planning permission because they're not residential there. They are, uh, because it's pre-existing business, they have other accommodation for their workers already sorted out. And so they could just get started with growing and production uh, without the residential element. And of course, it's the residential element that is so problematic for the, for the planning system. Uh, next, please. Uh, fourth is uh, Sparkford in Somerset and uh, again we bought that a couple of years ago. Um, we were we had great hopes that this um, was going to proceed a lot more quickly than uh, the first two sites through the planning process because um, we had a model that we we felt was working and we could show it worked um, and we did uh, move a little faster through the first stages of the planning application but uh, unfortunately, as we were due to come to the end of that process uh, early last year, um, COVID obviously struck and the, uh, the entire planning department, literally, as far as we understand, was moved over to uh, dealing with COVID. And so everything in the planning department pretty much stopped happening. And we are still awaiting a result from there. Although as far as we can tell, the indications are good. Um, the, the case officer has made various supportive comments. We're hoping that we're gonna get a positive decision on that literally any day now. 
uh, and we have, um, as Oliver was saying earlier, in terms of the application process, we um, uh, pre-agreed uh, three uh, sets of stewards to set up their businesses. One um, have started establishing their um, cider fruit tree business, um, which you can see that's a picture of there on the site, again, without a residential element, but they wanted somewhere to get their trees going. So we're um, taking an optimistic and positive step there and getting people started before we actually have the have the planning permission in place but without the residential element that's that's not necessary because obviously they're just carrying on agricultural work and fifth please uh, lastly is orchard park in cornwall and um, again we're at the early stages of the, of the planning application process and this is the only site where we do have uh, where the where the open application process is relevant so we are accepting inquiries and applications for that site at the moment um, it's just bare green fields, um, um, a place called Neverton, and um, yeah, please get in touch uh, with us if you'd be interested in applying right now. And Oliver will probably be the person that you'd be you'd be talking to. Thank you. Next one. Um, and yeah, so we're in the we are uh, looking for more land. Um, I think our model, as sort of previously explained, our model is was originally based on and is still based on a concept where we buy a freehold and then we sell a leasehold, and that allows us to to monitor the site with some with some level of of control and being able to affect what goes on there, so we can give our investors and, and the planning authority some confidence. Um, you know, we are willing to look at other models, but for various reasons, um, you know, that's the, that's the main one, but we're definitely happy to discuss with other people if you've got land that you want, uh, that you would like to work with the ELC on, but you don't want to sell it, we can discuss that with you, how that would work, but for us, um, obviously, offering the um, certainty for people wanting to take up a farming opportunity um, is really crucial for us because we need people to invest their heart and soul and blood, sweat and tears into this as any farming operation is. Um, and that can't really be done on a five or six or seven year um, tenancy agreement because it just doesn't give the stability and the certainty that people are looking for. So we do need to have some kind of long term um, ability to know uh, to know what's going to happen. But um, if you uh, are interested in ELC and you know of some land for sale near to you that you think would be suitable, then please do get in touch. We've, we, up to now, we've worked on a model where we have just bought land through, through word of mouth or on the open market, and then we have found people uh, who wanted to move to that area. Um, but that certainly doesn't have to be how it is. And, and in fact, I think there's lots to be said for a, a process where it's actually people that we are already working with and want to work with um, who find the land that is suitable for them. And that can definitely happen. If you know of anything or you want to work with us on that basis, then please do get in touch. Um, this slide gives you a very brief resume of the sorts of things that we're looking for. But if you're wanting to set up a agroecological business, then obviously your own common sense will tell you the, the basic uh, scenario that's needed, you, you know, decent access, decent growing conditions, not too exposed um, because we're a small scale. So I think that's actually the next slide. Well, I pretty much finished on the, the land. Yeah, if you um, if you know of land for sale that you think would be suitable for yourselves or for us, then please do get in touch. Um, and yeah, lastly, just wanted to say a couple of things about the monitoring process. So once people are set up, then um, there is an ongoing monitoring process, but we try and keep it as, um, you know, sort of, um, working with our stewards as much as possible um, and while everything is you know clear and obvious then it's a fairly it's a fairly clear process of a questionnaire and a visit to the site to sort of check that everything's going well and it's also an opportunity for people to talk about issues that they're having or um, problems or questions um, the, the basic elements of the monitoring plan of the monitoring which is based on on fitting the management plan is that there needs to be one person uh, working full time or or if it's more than one person working to the equivalent of a full time worker um, no subletting to other people no synthetic inputs herbicides pesticides etc um, conserving water and soil well um, making sure buildings are um, renewable to some degree reversible are, or low impact there's a whole discussion there about you know what's 
um, what would be suitable. And, and as of yet, nobody has built a permanent residence um, on an ELC site um, because I haven't been there that long. Or they're in the process of getting of sort of getting things ready. Um, and also crucially that there is um, there's a limit on the, the sell on price. So of course it's possible for things to change in your life and people to want to or need to leave and to want to sell their lease uh, back to ELC or to somebody else. But there is a cap on that so that we can retain the affordability uh, for people who would come after you. So there would be a valuation done of the work that's happened and the, and the farm. Um, but if you're the sort of... Um, farmer who wants gold taps and marble work surfaces and um, incredibly uh, luxurious fittings, then we may not be able to um, match the full value of that and there would be a cap as you sell it back to us. Uh, next please. Um, and yeah, we do that, we do that audit uh, both for ourselves and our own members and investors, um, but also uh, for the planning authorities, uh, for them to see what's happening. Um, although as of yet, we have never had a great deal of um, engagement from planning authorities when we've sent them our management plan and it's probably because they have too much work to do and it's, it's all <laughs> over their heads um, and too complicated. Um, but we report on the environment, the social and economic impact. Um, so across the board, we try and look at all the range of things that, in fact, that I talked about right at the beginning, that are the, the holistic context that we're in, which is both the local ecology, the, the wider ecology in terms of energy, um, energy use and energy generation, what's happening with waste, uh, the visual impact of buildings, making sure that, you know, things are um, of a size and of a type that is uh, fits in with the local landscape and so that every every farm and every holding is is still a credit to ELC and then we can use it as we go forward through different planning authorities to show the example of what existing people are doing and to show that we're nothing to be scared of and in fact there are loads of benefits from this kind of thing. Uh, next please. And I think to end is just some pictures um, of our sites. This is some of the, the different sites in the early stages when we first bought the fields. They all they were all fields. Um, one was arable, the rest were grassland. Um, there's a Greenham Reach is bottom right. The top right is Orchard Park, Arlington. There. Next, please. And then uh, the pictures of us beginning to put in the infrastructure, a track um where that's necessary across the land according to the landscape obviously we generally want to try and keep buildings um in a sort of development envelope and near to the road so that we're not putting tracks and hard standing across the field but that's not always the case um we build the barn and any basic infrastructure as sonia mentioned uh, next please uh, we do tree planting and we try and do this with volunteers uh, to engage the local community and get people started on site. Obviously that can happen um, before we've got planning permission, um, but we can plant shelter belts, um, maybe the boundary divisions, um, screening if there's any local houses or neighbours that are affected. Next please. Uh, and then once people, uh, once we have the permission and people are more fully on site, then more serious work can start making beds, cultivation. Uh, the bottom right there is um, Chris at Fanfield bringing on their mobile home with the help of a local farmer's tractor. We don't own any tractors like that. Um, next please. And um, some faces of our, our current and potential stewards. I won't go through them all in case they're listening. Can I get them? Mixed up, which I'm sure I wouldn't do. Uh, next, please. Uh, and some of the some of the growing beds uh, as of this year and last year from from Greenham and Arlington uh, and Kaitan, I think possibly, and some produce. Is that? Uh, some livestock. Some animals. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Ollie. Um, I just thought it was nice to show some examples at the end there of what it actually looks like. Um, so it is quarter to three. So we've got 45 minutes and I can see there is a host of different questions so we can start talking to those. But I think it might be nice to spend five minutes uh, watching the film that we made last year because it will just help kind of illustrate the points that we've we've covered and you can see 
our stewards kind of talking for themselves and what the sites actually look like. So hopefully, Oliver, we can make that happen. Um, if that, you ready, Oliver, or is it, do you want me to, um, we could do some questions first and come back to it otherwise? Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm just getting it ready now. I think um, it's going to take a, a minute to get set up. Okay. Well, well, in the meantime, um, we can start asking, answering some questions. Um, and there's a few kind of easier ones to start with, um, which is one of them is how many people are currently living in this way as part of the ELC? And um, I think I can answer that one. Um, at Greenham, there is three households, which is six adults plus four children, five children, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and Arlington, there is two households of two couples and there's just been a third household that have signed the lease, so it'll be three couples. Um, and in Sparkford, it will be again, three households, but um, they're not kind of fully on site yet, that one of the potential smallholders is a couple. So how, does that add, how many does that add up to? I'm not sure, but yeah, under around 20 or so in total with combining existing and potential stewards. So we've got a long way to go before we um, take over the UK in anthropology. <laughs> um, in fact, some good questions came up after I, after I spoke in terms of whether our plots are just available to couples um because that seems to be the case so far so do either oliver or ollie or um sonia if you could talk to that that would be really useful um we, there's no um we don't have a policy on you know who can apply um whether you're a single part of a pair or a bigger group um it's all it is all possible so it depends a bit where this question is coming from about what the exact answer is i mean i think it's probably mm -hmm. worth saying that we have had um, uh, requests and interest from people who are part of a bigger group um, before, and it's certainly it's not impossible. But there are um, difficulties with that that relate to the planning permission that we get, the resources on site, which are usually limited to some degree, the amount of buildings and traffic and various things that are generated by more people. Um, so. Yeah, I'd say there are, there are challenges with with being with being much bigger than a, a sort of simple family unit, if you like, like being multi generational or being like a large group of friends. Um, so I'd say yeah, there are challenges, but it's but you know nothing is impossible. So ask, uh, and obviously certainly a single person, um, it's a huge amount of work to take on on your own. But if you know you can do it, then there's absolutely no reason at all why you can't. Great, thank you. And one of the questions, we haven't mentioned Scotland at all. Um, so why not? If, why, what's going on in Scotland? I mean, I know the answer, but maybe Sonia, if you could talk about our project there or our collaboration there. Yeah, I can do that. Um, we don't operate in Scotland and we operate actually in a sort of, in the sort of, at the moment in the sort of Southwest or the, at least the south of England, and that's purely a logistical issue because um, we're a very small organisation and we need to be able to, at the moment, get between our sites. And there's a, you know, there's um, there are issues with like having um, to being too far spread out. Um, but Scotland um, also has a, a different sort of legislative um, system and different, um, well, different opportunities for um, for land. Um, for access to land and currently we're working with um, an organisation called the Scottish Farmland Trust and they are um, setting up to do something similar to the ELC and will be um, certainly be a sort of an equivalent organisation to the ELC in Scotland um, but navigating the specific um, context of Scotland, um, Scotland's land um, sort of policies and, and uh, governance and in order to support their development, we have a, a collaborative project working um, with the Scottish ELC, the Scottish Farmland Trust and Community Shares Scotland to get them to a position where um, they can run their own community share offer and, and looking at the ways that they can um, improve access to land, either by land purchase or um, uh, working with landowners in Scotland. So at the moment, we don't have a, a um, the ELC itself doesn't um, intend to go in work in Scotland, but we are working with uh, an equivalent organisation in the Scottish Farmland Trust to make land available for agroecology in a very similar way. I hope that answers the question. 
Great, thank you. Um, and then we've had a few questions about how we can work with existing landowners, whether that's through collaborating um, with people that want to make part of their land available to work with the ELC or or how we would kind of work with people that have a project set up to find land. So I know because our model at the moment is very much finding land and then finding um, our stewards. But if, if somebody could talk about how that doesn't have to be that way and, and what those models can look like. Um, maybe Sonia again. Can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have, um, basically we're willing to do anything necessary to get access to land in an affordable way. And we're very willing to talk to anybody who's got um, a project in mind or land available um, and, and we'll consider any uh, relationship. I think Ollie mentioned earlier that they're, in terms of leasing land from landholders, from landowners, sorry, um, you know, we'd need to consider, it would need to be a fairly long lease for us to consider it in order to be able to um, give our stewards the best opportunity to create their farm businesses and have a, um, and, and really put their, uh, you know, honour their commitment to that. Um, but yes, we're looking at the moment to purchase land um, of the, of the, uh, with the criteria that Ollie um, outlined in the presentation. Um, and we also um, are happy to discuss um, other ways of, of gaining access to land, either through the ELC providing management services to landowners or, um, uh, you know, taking on a long lease, maybe a 30, 30 plus year lease with a peppercorn rent and acting as the agent for um, the uh, for the relationship with the smallholders. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I could sort of go on because, but we do have a, a document that outlines quite sort of, um, well, hopefully quite sort of succinctly what, um, we're, what, what sort of things we would like, we would consider. Um, and we're also open to suggestions. So if you have any, um, any thoughts about how that might work, you know, do get in touch. The other thing that, the other side of that is working with organizations who need land um, so who may be already established an established community project or um, a farm business that needs to expand. Um, and we're very happy to, um, to look at um, the opportunities um, available for working together there. And Kaitan, I know Jeff from Kaitan's in the room and Kaitan CSA is a good example of uh, an organization that was already up and running, but needed extra, needed more land in order to fulfill their, the need for their um, fruit and veg boxes and we've been working with them for some time now they're resident on our uh, first hill site so I hope that answers the question um you know do get in touch is basically the, <laughs> the plea there if you've got any thoughts oh yeah thank you and yeah if you do email us we can share that document with us of the different ways that we've outlined that we can work with um, existing landowners um one question for Ruth is um we're talking about the the kind of expected financial viability. Um, yeah, what sort of financial viability are we looking for in terms of potential farm businesses? Um, and I asked Ruth because it's it's tied in with our, our planning commission as she spoke about. Hi there, yeah. Um, so th the specific requirements will vary from local authority to local authority, but there isn't any national requirement in England to achieve minimum wage at all. Um, which leaves it fairly open to interpretation, which is good. Um, so it, no, I think is, is the answer. There isn't a specific, uh, a specific amount you need to be earning. You just need to show that the business is bringing in an income and is sustainable um, financially, and that's it. There, then there may still be certain local authorities that um, have a slightly older policy, which may require a certain amount of, um, financial income, which will usually be to demonstrate an agricultural minimum wage. But I think at this point, we would argue that that was outdated and that we shouldn't need to demonstrate that. Great, thank you. Can I just, can I just add one thing to that? Um, we do um, require that people are generating a, um, a sort of basic amount of money to cover their basic costs. So like over from their farm business because we need to make sure that people are actually fulfilling the the terms of an agricultural tie so sort of traditionally um the, the kind of uh, legal clause that meant that that meant that a residential dwelling could only be used for agriculture was called an agricultural tie and it meant only people who are involved in agriculture can live in that building and so we have a sort of modern version of that uh, but to make sure that people do fulfill that we do uh, ask that people are generating 
um, a certain income, and that has to be in relation to the amount that they're ex they're, they're expending as a or spending uh, as a as a unit or a couple or a family. Um, like you know, roughly over fifty percent um, of their of their costs need to be covered by their farm business. Great, thank you, both of you. Um, I've got one question, which is more the kind of overall structure of the cooperative. So how do we organise as a cooperative and other farmers involved? And we didn't actually include that in detail in the presentation, but um, someone can definitely speak to that, either Ollie or Oliver, maybe? Oliver? I'm so I'm in the process of just kind of that's finding fine. the video. So if you could answer, right. that would be great. That's fine, Ollie, sure. yeah, go for it. Um, I mean, yeah, there's various layers <laughs> we could go into detail. I mean, essentially, the day to day work of the organization is carried out by a staff team, um, which um, and, the, and the way there's a board of directors who are elected by the whole membership. Um, they oversee the strategic governance and direction. There's Sonia, who's here, who is the operations manager, who oversees the staff. Um, we have a remote staff working team and as you as you've heard people are involved in either dealing with applications or developing a site or the planning applications or our finance uh, we have a couple of people who aren't on this call mary who does our fundraising etc um and most of us are part-time sonia is full-time we're just in the process of taking of recruiting more um more people to enlarge the organization um the staff have regular staff meetings and the organization as a whole has an annual general meeting once a year uh, last year it was in zoom obviously no idea what's going to happen this year um where which is an opportunity for everyone to get together um in terms of farmer involvement i mean there's certainly room for for people to get involved um and hopefully that will grow and increase over time but i think it's it's probably right to say that up to now the farmers have not been involved very much in the organizational development because it's such an incredibly arduous and full-time job to establish a farm from basically a um, from nothing essentially from a plain bare field and get an established sustainable ecological community connected uh, farm business that's fulfilling all the numerous criteria that is not a part-time job and doesn't doesn't allow much time to be involved in, in also running an organization like ELC um, but over time, as people become more established on their holdings, get their permanent permission um, and, um, yeah, you know, have a, a greater understanding of all the elements of the organisation, then that is definitely the hope and the intention that the farmers and the stewards themselves would take over as much as possible or as much as they want to of the decision making and the development of the organization and in fact that is obviously the point of a cooperative is that you know people are working together wherever they are whatever they're doing with one aim and that will be up to a certain point which is unknown to grow the to grow the organization and create more opportunities i don't know sonia would you want to add to anything of there or no, I thought that was perfect answer. <laughs> like, I don't think there's anything else to add. Great, thank you both. Um, just want to check in with Ola about this film if we're ready to go or not. Otherwise, we'll continue with questions. That's fine. Yeah, I think we. I think we're ready to go. Great, um, no. I'm going to I'm going to <laughs> share my screen and fingers crossed it'll work this time. Brilliant, thank you. Sinead and Adam, they run Orside Farm and then another farm to the field over in this corner. You can see today that we're doing some tree planting, there's lots of people around. So we decided during 2020 we wanted to plant 2020 trees. Our principles around growing are more trees, more flowers and healthy soil. So the first thing to work on is the more trees. We focus on a lot of like edible flowers, cut flowers, and kind of thinking about food a little bit differently. We've got quite a few things to crack on with this year. I think we live in times that are showing just how important it is to be an agroecological farmer. It's really moving us towards a place where we understand the impact that what we've been doing for the last sort of 30 years has on the environment. Agroecology is important because we win across different areas. Dealing with the climate crisis that we've got right in front of us now, it's really urgent. Helping biodiversity and nature 
and producing healthy food and healthy materials for people. We wanted to run a veg box scheme and I wasn't happy doing that on land that I knew could end in, in six months to 12 months because I could just let a lot of people down. So we decided to look for an active piece of land that we could regenerate the soil, put a lot of work into the ecosystem of it, but also would be here for a long period of time, our, our future home if you like. Someone had just mentioned the Ecological Land Cooperative. We went in thinking this is far too good to be true. This can't be people that are setting something up that's genuinely for good and, and that aligns with our sort of goals. And six months later, we're here. And, and it, yeah, I still have to pinch myself every day. The central objectives of the ALC are to purchase marginal agricultural land and to get planning permission in order for our steward farmers to live and work on the land that they own. We also are very committed to developing regenerative farming techniques. We have always dreamed of doing something like this, but we had it in a 10-year, 15-year plan rather than a now plan. <laughs> We've managed to plant over a thousand trees today. We're planning to extend the lake here and have it as a real like nature reserve type space. I think we've had about 50 people today and all coming together to plant trees and improve like the habitat space on this field is amazing. I live in the next village, so I was really sort of keen to get down and show some support. Quite excited to have this on, on the doorstep. Oh, Queenie. Yeah, come on, I need to put a plastic sheath on this one. This is where you'll be able to buy your fruit and veg grown in the field next to your house. It doesn't get better than that. The Ecological Land Cooperative is answering, for me, two main issues. One is the fact that it is so difficult for new entrants to get onto land, and we're answering that by providing affordable starter holdings. And the other side of it is we have to do farming differently. We know that we've depleted the soils, that we have lost soil carbon, that we have water pollution and air pollution problems. And there's a growing body of people that have got great ideas, agroecology, agroforestry, permaculture, and by providing affordable starter farms, those can be trialled and we can see something wonderful happening. I think some of the big challenges that we found is, you know, we're city people, like we have no idea, like where do you start looking for land? And the ELC have been great for us because they were an organisation that helped us do that. Like a lot of those kind of logistical things around planning and yeah, they've just made the whole process a lot easier. The challenge is that there isn't access to land. When you look at the costs involved, they're just enough to put you off. A lot of talks that we went to, it originated from a you inherit land and it kind of feels like you only do it if you're born into it, whereas DLC provided a platform for people like us to be given a chance to go and do this. structure that they offered allowed us to be able to afford it to move here to start with and they supported the planning process so it seemed a lot more of a secure option for a family with children to commit to. So this is violet willow which is Salix daphnoides and we harvest the bark and then we dry that and put it either in tea mixes, tincture it or make it into powder to put into capsules for rheumatic achy conditions, things like that. What's different about the ERC is that we make sure that land stays in agricultural use and ecological use in perpetuity. So although we give the stewards really long leases, 150 years, so they can really build up their farm business, we also make sure we keep hold of the freehold so that the land isn't then just sold out of farming and ecological use. We moved here in April 2015. And then last year, in 2019, the great news came through from Mid Devon District Council that we have secured permanent permission. We are allowed to live here permanently as long as we're running our agricultural business and we have the right to build a permanent home. We are seeing the trees growing taller than me now, which is really exciting. 
and we've just got lots to look forward to. Gaining that permanent permission last year, the good feeling of living here when you wake up every day is brilliant. It's really humbling to like have this responsibility, I guess. Regeneration is something that's really important to us, in trying to fix the things that are broken. And to be able to do that and you know see it coming together now with these trees going in is makes you feel quite teary. <laughs> yeah. Great, thanks Oliver. Um, sorry about the glitchiness for that everyone, but yeah, um, Sonia posted the YouTube link in the chat if you did want to catch it again later. Um, but hopefully the sound was good enough to follow what was going on. Um, so yeah, we will crack on with some more questions. And I've got a few um, questions for you, Oliver, about the kind of steward application process. Um, the first one being, yeah, how competitive is it to get a tenancy if we have the long waiting list? Um, until you can access the land. Um, and then what are the main challenges stewards face when setting up the project? Second mm. question. Well, there's, um, um, there isn't a long waiting list. Um, what we tend to find is that the um, process is structured in such a way that um, people who are really, are really serious about what we um, offer and have really done the thinking um, and consideration of what a huge lifestyle change it might be. Get through to the, the second stage of the process where actually there's, there's only a, a relatively few applicants in that stage. So it's in the early stages, a lot of people that, um, uh, uh, you know, will think this through very carefully and realize it's not for them and then maybe not make an application. So for example, I think in the course of the last year or so we've received probably like around 20 applications and business plans for around 10 sites and 10 plots so you know in a way there's there's if you are really serious about um about this lifestyle change and, and agro ecological farming and you um are able to to put a business plan together an application together then it then, then there's only a relatively small pot of people that you know are in that stage um, what was the second question, Lauren? It was just um, the challenges, the main challenges stewards face when setting up. Um, I think that um, it's the, the combination of living on site and moving on site and living in a um, in temporary accommodation like a static caravan, which admittedly can be made very comfortable with a, you know, with a wood burner and, and cladding and things like that. But it's that it's almost like that it's like moving house and starting a business at the same time and a, and a land based business, which um, which obviously takes uh, a really significant amount of physical work as well as uh, as well as, um, you know, mental and emotional work. So I'd say that it's that first couple of years, like setting up, like setting up any business, really, um, which is in, particularly intense, but probably even more intense because it involves potentially a move from one side of the country to another or onto um, into a kind of a, a low impact situation where, you know, life is very, very different. Great, thank you. And a follow up question to that is, is how we kind of select stewards um, on one plot, whether we put effort into kind of different businesses complementing each other. Um, and then how do we kind of encourage them to work collaboratively? Well, I think um, what tends to happen is that, well, certainly we, firstly, we do think very carefully about um, establishing businesses that do complement one another. Um, and um, I think that the stewards tend to quite quickly find sort of, sort of synergies between those businesses. So, um, although, you know, it's not certainly isn't a prerequisite for um, stewards on a, on a single site to be you know, working closely together and collaborating um, and, and synergizing, that's does tend to happen, I think, quite, quite naturally. Um, so for example, um, a, a farm that um, is set up as a CSA producing veg boxes 
might also include um, uh, the opportunity for people to add um, bouquets of flowers from the, the flower farm, which is sort of residing next door. Um, so those kinds of synergies, I think that increasingly we're seeing, particularly as we're developing more and more sites, um, becoming more and more, um, yeah, more and more exciting, actually. Great, thank you. Um, and a question for you, Ollie, I think, is, is, is about the kind of infrastructure set up and what does ELC do in compared to what the stewards are expected to do when they move on and the kind of costs of those things? Um, so I guess we sort of look at it as we do the sort of the basic uh, setup stuff. So in, in all cases so far, we've needed to do work on the access uh, to because we're going to be seeing you know more traffic and a range of uh, vehicles getting on and off the site as opposed to what was probably there previously just literally a sort of farm gate um, which tractors have compacted and made a mess of but don't mind um, so we do a bit of work with the access that often involves working with the highways because of visibility and a lot of regulations around that and then we want to provide a basic level of resources for people um, so that they are getting established with something to use so some shelter and storage space and workspace with a barn or a building um, a, a level of electricity and water supply um, but I mean I think we view it as I mean it depends what what level of resource use you know you and your business are aiming for but I personally would view it as a as a sort of setup amount and then in most cases people will want to build on that as they develop and once they're sure that they're there and they know what they're going to use and what they're going to need whether that's more or less water or more or less electricity or more or less buildings I mean obviously there's going to be buildings um, whether it's a, a simple tool shed and a polytunnel or more elaborate buildings for packing sheds and livestock and dairying depends totally on the business uh, anything that really is going to is, is relates to the specifics of a business we would leave that to the steward and we just do the the basic setup but that obviously also has a cost um to us as an organization and then we pass that on to um, to the stewards in in the total price of the lease um, that people are going to pay overall and you know I guess there is, there is a case um, that we do less infrastructure to start with and people pay a lesser price but then they've got a more difficult setup process so you know it's a it's a discussion basically. Great thank you and one specific question um, kind of related is in terms of organic certification, whether we can certify whole sites and whether that would make it more cost effective. And I know there's been an example of that at Arlington, if if you could speak about that briefly. Do you want me to, do you want me oh, to? Sonia, yeah, great. Um, we, yeah, we were, well, we, we obviously, well, well, obviously, but we registered the field at Arlington um, and put it into the certification process, into conversion. Um, when it was still a, a field with no no uh, farms on it um and we were we have been able to maintain that one as the farms that certification as the farms um have been setting up um but it does raise its own uh kind of issues for the smallholders because they're tied it means that their certification is tied together they're tied to each other um so there are some benefits because it's cheaper um and um, they can share the, uh, the reporting. Um, but actually there is, there's also a benefit to, um, for, to individual farms having their own certification because it means that if um, their neighbors, if there is an infraction of the rules by one of their neighbors, they don't lose their organic status. So, it, you know, if there's a, a, a sort of close working ability to have a close working relationship and, um, and you know, a good level of trust, then it's possible to have a cert certification across the site. But it's not necessarily ideal. Great, thank you. So, so I just add to say it's not re it's not a requirement of ELC that there is certification because in a way we have our own monitoring to make sure that the sort of basic ecology is being looked after. But in certain cases, we might choose to do it for the site overall, as we did at Arlington, or people might choose to do it just themselves um, for their own holding, as Elder Farm have done at Green and Reach, where the other two are not certified through the Soil Association. Yeah, that's quite an important point that, that the ELC doesn't require um, smallholders to be uh, certified organic, because obviously that adds quite a, a, a high, you know, a big cost into the, um, the business. Um, 
Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And I think um, a few questions for Ruth. Um, I think Ruth might be the best person in terms of planning. Um, a few people have asked about what happens when you want to retire. Um, and then another planning question is, um, let me get the wording correct. Um, is yeah, how is the local planning policy slash red tape limiting your opportunities to expand our work? So that's quite a big question. Um, um, yeah, to go from a, a small um, small question to a big question. <laughs> uh, planning wise, when you retire, um, an agricultural tie um, covers retired farm workers. So you can stay living, from a planning perspective, you can stay living in your home. And I'm assuming that's the same from the ELC's perspective. But Ollie, can you just confirm that or Sonia? Yes. <laughs> Good. Um, and the other question, the red tape barriers to expanding our work, planning barriers to expanding our work. Yeah, that's a big question. I mean, I think hopefully they're getting less and less as our model becomes more established, obviously, and then we have more positive examples under our belt. It make, should, fingers crossed, make the planning process smoother for us. Um, also, local authorities are improving their local plans and becoming more climate aware. And we've got Cornwall, for example, and I think Devon's just started doing one, Mid Devon, um, have got climate emergency policy, um, which includes often something similar to the One Planet Development or definitely has more of an allowance and specific reference to local food production, community resilience and things like that. So theoretically, it's very, I think I would say it's positive and I think that the red tape is becoming less and less. Um, I'd also add that red tape is important as well. So it's kind of, you know, it's all got to be utterly weighed up. Like we don't want loads and loads of development in the countryside, obviously. Um, so frustrating as planning is, and it is incredibly frustrating a lot of the time for what we want to achieve. And we know that we're trying to do something really positive and really, really good, but we have to also understand it from the, perspective of the council who are wanting to protect the countryside and even though that is what we're doing it's kind of very important that there, 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 there is tape for us to get through in order to get that done um have i answered the question i hope so <laughs> great it's thanks. a big question but um but no thank you ruth um Oliver, a few questions, um, and then I'll move on to a kind of another topic of, of training, and which has come up a bit. Um, but one question is: Has there been a most popular and successful size of the plot? Um, oh. So, offer that one first. Um, that's an interesting question. I think that um, early on in the application process, a lot of applicants are unsure what the size of plot would be ideally suited for their business. So we tend to, um, I think often go, you know, apply for the, the larger plots, which are often around 10 acres, um, and then maybe um, reconsider and go for, go for something a bit more um, on the smaller side. I mean, we, we, uh, for example, um, at our site in Orchard Park in, in, in Cornwall, we have a, a 10 acre plot, I think a six acre plot and a, and a three acre plot. And definitely the 10 acre plot there has, has been most popular in terms of, of applications, but not all of the businesses in terms of our kind of view of them necessarily ideally suited to a 10 acre plot, which we would expect to see um, businesses that involve some form of um, uh, of livestock. That kind of the idea is that that, that would be um, ideal, ideally suited for a 10 acre plot um so yeah hopefully that's answered that question yeah brilliant thank you oliver um and the second question is and you answered it in the presentation a little bit but um the level of experience we expect for applying stewards yeah so you know we're really open to receiving inquiries from people who you know are still fairly early on and you know in their journey of becoming agroecological farmers and what we can do in that situation is kind of make an assessment and maybe point those people in the direction of um, training or work experience that they that we would recommend that they kind of look into in order to kind of get to a, a um, slightly greater level of experience. Um, in terms of the um, the applicants that um, uh, you know we've been working with in the 
in the second stage of the application process and have ultimately offered leases to. They have, um, I think, demonstrated um, largely a kind of a level of commitment to um, agroecological farming that has involved a whole range of like uh, either paid or volunteer work on a variety of different farms over a number of different seasons. So I think um, you know, broadly speaking, the kind of the, mi the minimum level of experience that we would, we would, we would expect to see from a, a strong applicant is at least one or two full seasons working on a, on a farm scale agricultural project, either as a, a volunteer, uh, a part-time worker or a full-time worker. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, people that have um, gained experience in other ways um, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't be considered, you know, there's, there's very much, um, I think, a focus on the experience of working at that level on a kind of that farm scale level, which I think is so important in terms of shaping and defining um, uh, a business plan. You know, it's almost like there's a cyclical process between the experience of, of, of working in some way in farm scale agriculture and how that feeds into the development of a, a viable business plan. What we can sometimes see is a business plan that look fantastic, got great ideas. Um, and uh, in terms of our experience of what is achievable, um, they don't have the kind of element of realism that actually um, working um, and the sort of the real, real solid hands-on experience can really feed into to create kind of a, a slightly more viable business plan. Um, but there's a few people asking about kind of training and mentoring and, and how we can kind of help people go from a lack of farm experience or not coming from a farming background to then accessing land and whether that's part of our work or, or who we collaborate with um, in relation to that. And we could, we could mention in the answer um, our upcoming collaboration with Land in Our Name, Lion, as well. Um, so maybe between Sonia and Ollie, you could talk about that. We don't, we're not a training organisation, I guess it's fair to say. Um, so far, what we've done is, is sort of direct people, signpost people to where they may be able to get the sort of training or experience they want. Um, I think it's not it's not ELC's sort of speciality to do that and the Landworks Alliance at the moment is developing various schemes and has taken on some recent staff to develop uh, accredited training and farm mentoring schemes and all, all sorts of different um, sort of training opportunities and to try and get better links between existing producers and um, new entrants. Um, so I think the short answer is we don't do we don't do much. Um, the, the sort of providing some mentoring for people getting started once they're on their site, I think, was mentioned in the presentation. Um, so we will try and you know offer a, a bit of signposting and linking up with specific people. Um, but yeah, I think it's more about using some of the other resources that are out there in terms of getting the training that you need. And I mean, I'm sure that um, Lauren in the chat, or if you contact us, we can you know, um, put you, send you in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, we have had, we, we are partners in the LWA, with the LWA, the CSA Network and Organic Growers Association in a mentoring scheme. Um, and we have had, uh, I mean, we've had at least one of, one of our new farmers at Arlington um, participated in that and had, men, a men, you know, it, well, was part of that mentoring program last year and had it, um, um, a full year of mentoring from a, an established CSA grower locally. Um, and there are lots of, well, not lots of opportunities, but there are opportunities that we're kind of linked into that we can, as Ollie said, sort of signpost you to. We also, as Oliver said, make recommendations that um, we, that you um, get experience through, um, either through woofing or other opportunities to work on, on um, uh, existing uh, agroecological farms. And we make, um, as part of the um, assessment process, we, we try to, well, in, in, if, it's, if it's possible and certainly hasn't been possible recently because of the uh, COVID-19 situation, um, but if it's possible, we would arrange for a placement on one of our um, existing small holdings, ELC small holdings as well, just so that you can get a feel for what it's like being part of the ELC. Um, sorry, Lauren, you said something about Lion, but I didn't really hear. Yeah, what... if you could just, um, someone's mentioned it in the chat, so it'd be good to talk about um, the upcoming um, collaboration there. 
Yeah, so we are working with um, Lion, which is um, Land in Our Names, which is a um, collective of um, BPIs, BPOC people in the UK who are interested in land justice and uh, for um, minority communities in the UK and um, you know improved access to land. Um, we talked. I talked earlier about our project with the Scottish Farmland Trust, and in some respects, uh, we're hoping to do something similar with um, uh, Lion. Um, but the first phase of it, we've just been had a project funded, um, which will enable us to do some research in the first instance to to talk to people about well, people of colour about their experiences um, of trying to access land in the UK and what the barriers are really trying to identify those barriers and also um, you know how they overcame them because um, there are many people of colour um, actually you know running farms uh, working in projects across the UK so that's the first part of the project and then we'll take the findings of that to um, organisations throughout the agroecology sector to try and improve their processes and their sort of understanding um, of the current situation and the final part of the final phase of that project is to build the capacity of Lion to actually become a land trust so hopefully they'll be able to access land for projects um, for growing projects and for people to have um, you know possibly similar to the ELC um, small holdings um, where they can start their farm businesses. Great, thank you. Right, we're very nearly out of time. I've got one quick question um, for Ollie is about kind of diversification on farm and whether um, camping, eco camping could be part of a business, which I know the answer to. So I think it'd be useful to, to make people make that clear to people. Um, well, it could be a small part, I suppose, but it can't be the main part um, because we have an agricultural tie and what we're about is getting produce from make, making land, uh, managing land ecologically whilst also providing produce. So um, educational, camping, tourism elements can, can fit in, but they need to be clearly an add-on and not the basis um, because it's the, it's the food production and the, the, the you know, resource system that we need to change, um, not really the way that people camp and have tourism in this country so that's not a judgment on people doing camping schemes but um i guess for us the, for, for us the, the important thing is is agriculture and produce and, and in fact forestry and which hasn't got a mention but we're really hoping that in the next few years we can develop some forestry and some woodland holdings as well um we haven't managed to do that yet because of the increased land areas that are needed um to get a viable forestry business but we're really hoping to be able to do that and, and and I think as we develop we can expand the definition of what we mean by ecological management and production but at the moment you know we are stuck in a, a certain context and we're not a big enough organization to develop in all the ways that we want so we have to go step by step um, but for sure if you're unclear about when something is an add-on or when it's a sort of main part of a business then that again would be to take up with us in detail. Brilliant. Thank you all so much. I think that was really good and hopefully useful for our 60 plus participants. Um, if anyone's questions haven't been answered, then please feel free to email, email us. Um, our email addresses are all on our website um, and you can also find lots of different information there and watch the film again if you, if you didn't catch it um, in good quality this time. But other than that, yeah, thank you, Oliver, Ollie, Ruth and Sonia for your time answering everyone's questions. And I think we will leave it there. So you enjoy the rest of the ERFC.